Hello, my name is Dave Eckert, and I work at Access Services in the Philadelphia area for the Intersect Initiative. And as I come to you to speak today about supporting people with mental illness in your congregation and community, I want to take seriously both the congregation and the community, because in my own experience of working both in the public mental health system and as a pastor in the church, I really want to bring these worlds together. And that's the heartbeat of my work with Intersect, is fostering collaboration between faith communities and human service providers. Now, it's worth just nailing down what we mean when we say mental illness before we get going. The Mayo Clinic provides a standard definition, you know, that it's a, it refers to a wide range of mental health conditions or disorders that affect your mood, thinking, and behavior. Common examples are things like depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, eating disorders, addictive disorders. In all this, we just want to clarify that today's training isn't about people with intellectual disabilities or traumatic brain injuries. It's about people with mental illness. Now, as we talk about mental illness or people with mental health struggles and how we can support them, I want to make it clear what this training isn't as much as what it is. It isn't a cure. There's nothing I'm trying to say, if you just do this, then everything will be better, which also means it's not a formula. There's no one, two, three steps to finding the answers to all our questions. Um, and it's not just to focus on one kind of relationship. Th this could be a relationship between a friend, uh, between spouses. It could be a person who's, you know, a person in their church, a fellow congregant that they're trying to walk with. A number of different relationships, a number of different diagnoses could be involved. And yet, I think the material we're going to be looking at can still be of some help to you, even though, as we said, it's not a formula and it's not a cure. Now, for all that this training isn't, what is it then? Well, what we're looking at are tools for supporting people over time in a way that maintains your health as the helper and provides opportunities for a person to change in ways that are helpful to them that they see as helpful to their wellness and recovery. Now there are five approaches that we're gonna look at to help regardless of a person's diagnosis. So you could be helping someone with bipolar disorder, someone with depression, someone who's hearing voices. And I think these five approaches are helpful in whatever situation you're in. It doesn't mean it's not worth doing psychoeducation and learning about specific disorders, learning about some of those diagnostic criteria, but I think these approaches are helpful to all of us in walking with people well. And these five approaches are to be open, relational, holistic, sustainable, and resourceful. And the rest of this training is going to be walking through each of these. First, be open. Uh, we need to be open and open up dialogue within our faith communities. I once had a father of a person with mental health struggles say to me right after I preached on the topic that he didn't know until that sermon that he could talk about that here in our church. He just didn't know because no one had told him not to talk about it, but he just didn't think it was the sort of thing you bring up at our church. Also, we need to open up dialogue because very many people assume that mental illness is an epidemic out there, but it's not an experience in here. And not until we bring it up in our faith communities in an, an intentional way, do people realize it's not just an epidemic, it's an experience among us. So how do we do that? Well, a few kind of pieces of wisdom here. First, remember to give the gift of presence before the gift in quotations, of advice. If you look in the book of Job in scripture, you see Job's friends, before they start going off the rails with their uh, uninformed advice, they, start, they first sit with him for seven days in silence. And that's really valuable in being with people. Also, ask what would be helpful to a person instead of stating what they need, right? 
let them tell you because they're the experts on their own experience. They've been living with it for years. You haven't. Let them tell you what's helpful. Also consider giving the gift of going second. What is the gift of going second? I read this in an Ann Voskamp book who spoke about the gift of going second is when you go first and share what your own struggle is so that other people can feel comfortable going second. That's what a lot of the Me Too movement was about is giving people the, the opportunity to share their story after, hurting, after hearing someone else share theirs. Also use language that can both normalize and clarify. What do I mean by this? Well, we need to use language that normalizes, that's human to people, that people feel comfortable with. That's what you call person first language or person centered language. For example, you see there in the second item, being able to say, this is Bob who happens to have an experience of schizophrenia rather than making it their identity. Bob is a schizophrenic. And you'll notice language that can clarify something like a mental illness maybe feels a little bit more normalized with the language of a mental health struggle. Some people feel more comfortable talking about a bad day than a breakdown or about a fog they're in rather than depression. We might need to be clarifying if we're going to be clear that we're talking about mental illness here, but we want to be normalizing so that people are comfortable with getting help. So in your own space, discuss open dialogue. What are the challenges of talking about mental illness publicly or openly within your context? And what language would you say is most helpful for you to use in normalizing this? So we've looked at being open. Let's also look at being relational. We have the need for relational support uh, that we see. Uh, needs like the isolating effect of mental illness. Um, that oftentimes people go inside of themselves and separate from others. Um, also, we have the fact that there are people out there, Jenny, who is a local a director of a homeless shelter, I remember telling me, I'd much rather you be with the people in my shelter. Come and just spend time with them rather than always serving them soup or always soup or always getting them clothing. They need those things, but they also are lonely and just need someone to be with them. Um, and this is also really needed because people go to those they know first. They're going, people are going to go to you if you're a clergy, if you're a person in a congregation, they may go to you before they go to a mental health professional. So you need to be ready for that and aware that um, people may come to you and, and therefore value the relationship, knowing that it may earn you the street cred for people to reach out to you for help. So what does relational help involve? Well, remember relationships are the vehicle for change. So change takes place when one person builds into another with whom they have a relationship, which means get tune-ups to your relationship. Make sure your relationship's in a healthy place so that you can say what needs to be said. Build relational capital with people, earn that capital, but don't be afraid to spend it you may be in just the right place to say something that someone will hear from you that they wouldn't hear from someone with whom they did not have a relationship. Encourage people doing what they least want and most need, which is namely getting around with other people. I've had many people with depression say to me that the last thing they wanna do is go to a small group meeting or to a faith community gathering. But when they do it, they realize it's the thing they needed most. You can explore peer support options. You know, who, what that means is who are people within your faith community that have a lived experience of a mental health struggle that can help other people in your community who have that same experience. And also know your unique role within their support system. You don't need to be everything. If you're a friend, if you're a sister, be a friend or a sister. You don't need to be a therapist or a psychiatrist. It's worth different people having different sorts of relationships with people and all those relationships can contribute to that person's wellness. Now, an obstacle to relational support is armchair psychiatry. Armchair psychiatry is when we have these causality cravings. We have to know the cause of why someone's acting the way they are. And it causes us then to make 
psychiatric declarations, diagnostic declarations that we really don't have the skill to make. To help us ward off this obstacle of armchair psychiatry, keep a few things in mind. People are more alike than different. We're all humans, and therefore there's a lot of human um, struggle that happens within a mental illness that we can relate to another person around. Um, remember the danger of misdiagnosis. When you start diagnosing people in an uninformed way, you can do more harm than good because it can cause people to go down paths they shouldn't. And finally, um, remember that a diagnosis is valuable if, if it helps me understand how to be with someone when I'm with them. If I know someone has a diagnosis of Asperger's or autism, uh, as, it, as Asperger's isn't really used that language anymore. I know now that the person is going to be really concrete in how they communicate and I should be concrete as well. But if I'm just using a diagnosis because it makes me feel more in control or above a certain person, that's not building relational help. So in your own context, discuss relationships. Talk about or ask yourself these questions. What is a potential challenge for you of developing a supportive relationship with someone struggling with their mental health? Also, how does your role in their life impact how you relate to their recovery? Important questions for discussion. So we've looked at being open. We've looked at being relational. Third, it's important that we be holistic. There is truly a need for holistic support because People are both and people. We're not just physical, we're spiritual people as well. As I sometimes say, God has made us into embodied image bearers. Um, so I remember a friend of mine, um, Josh, telling our congregation once that he needed both medication and scripture memorization to be in a good place. The medication helped him physically, the scripture memorization helped him spiritually and gave him hope, both helpful to his wellness. And the answer is often yes to this puzzle of what's causing this in a person. Is it poverty? Is it spirituality? Is it their mental health diagnosis? Is, you know, which is it? Is it trauma? The answer is yes. All of those things can contribute to why a person is acting the way they are. And we want to take all of them into account in our response, not just drill down on one and uh, leave the others aside. It has been said before that if all you have is a hammer, everything is a nail, right? If all I know is how to talk about faith, that's all I'll talk about. If all I know is to talk about physical issues, that's all I'll talk about. Support the whole person, the spiritual, the social, the emotional, the physical. Know which area you tend to gravitate to and live out of that strength while not ignoring these other aspects of how we are made by God. Integrated health is something that today is given a lot of credence. And in integrated health, we want to integrate all aspects of who a person is. And this is an example of with integrated health, if you look at all these different issues, all of that can be helpful to a person. From prayer all the way down to a psychiatrist. From, you know, faith-based counseling to someone just getting some sleep. All of those things can be helpful and consider having all of these kind of with you as tools to offer someone at the right time. Um, speaking of tools, you may wanna consider this tool of a wellness and recovery action plan. You can Google that. Uh, you can look it up at the link that I provide you there, but it's a way to help someone with mental illness be able to plan for their own wellness. A wellness toolbox is all the things they can do, like the list we just looked at under Integrate Health, that help bring them to a good place with their mental health. A daily maintenance plan is what people are gonna do each day, in morning, afternoon, evening, to build good rhythms in their life. Um, in this plan, you can identify triggers, you can identify early warning signs so that I know things are getting to a hard place. And you also have the capacity here to do some crisis planning. Who am I going to call? What am I going to do on a really bad day? As well as post-crisis planning, which is, I just went through a crisis. Now, what can I learn about it for next time? All of these are tools that can help you provide holistic support in another person's life. 
So in your context, discuss these questions about holistic support. What connections have you seen between people's mental, physical, social, spiritual, and emotional health? How do you see those relating to one another and impacting each other? Also, what dimensions of integrated health require more of your attention? Where do you tend to focus a lot and where do you not focus enough? So far, we've looked at open support, relational support, holistic support, but support also has to be sustainable as well. This is a big one. There's a need for sustainable support because many people who are in a training like this one know of the reality of burnout. It just becomes too hard um, and you just walk away. Um, it's also important because the fact is relapse is part of recovery. If you're walking with someone, the chances are it's not just going to be over after they take a few steps. This is a lifelong journey for many people of recovery. And finally, recovery isn't a linear process. Even though gro uh, growth can happen, and we have hope that growth does happen in many people's lives, it doesn't mean it's going to happen in some sort of linear way. Oftentimes, it may be more circular, maybe two steps on one step back, or one step up, two steps back. In all those ways, we just need to be ready for the long-term process of support and be able to sustain that. So one way we can provide sustainable support is through self-care. Consider your own mental health, your own physical health. Are you paying attention to those things? Are you exercising? Are you getting breaks from walking with a person who may even be living in your own house with you? What is your own support system? Who are you reaching out to and talking to for help? And what are your other roles and responsibilities in your life, whether it be a parent or a friend? Whatever that looks like, you need time to give to your other roles and responsibilities. If you don't give time to those things, you're eventually going to say, I can't do this anymore. And you're going to walk away from the person that you know you love and want to support. Another way to offer sustainable support is through boundaries. Set boundaries like we do in all relationships. No matter what the relationship is, there's no relationship that doesn't have boundaries. Even my best friend, if he comes and stands over my bed in the middle of the night, has broken a boundary. I'm going to say, dude, start knocking on the door. Okay, this is too much, right? All of us have boundaries. So set them in our helping relationships as well. But prepare people for when you're going to set them. Prepare them first. Talk about the boundary before you set it. Also, contain yourself before offering something. So when you're looking, or not before, continue yourself by offering something, which means if you need to say no to someone who's asking you for something that you can't do, it doesn't need to be no, 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 I can't. It can be, this is what I can do. Oh, they're arguing with you, they're arguing. This is what I can do. Contain yourself by offering something. If someone's telling me, Dave, I just need to talk to you for seven days a week. Containing yourself by offering something is saying, I can talk to you on Tuesdays and Thursdays from seven to eight. But Dave, I need this time. I need this time. I can talk to you from Tuesdays and Thursdays from seven to eight. Those are ways of containing yourself by not just saying no to something, but by offering something. Also, define success according to what's within your control. If I am serving homeless people and success is only that homeless people be housed just like I'd want them to be every single night, then I'm setting myself up for frustration because I'm bound to find that I can't control a person's bad decisions and I can't control if the system doesn't have affordable housing. What I can control though is how hard I work every day. I can control whether I've done my best to find as many housing resources as possible. Define success according to what's within your control. And finally, focus on the current stage of change that the person you're serving is in. So here's some different stages of change. And I'm going to use an example of weight loss for how this stages of change model can work. If I want to lose some weight and I'm in pre-contemplation, I'm not even thinking about losing weight. I'm not even contemplating it. In contemplation, I'm now considering, do I want to lose weight or not? Preparation saying, I think I want to lose weight. I need to find out the right plan. Action is, I've actually put the plan into place and I'm losing weight. 
and maintenance is I'm maintaining the changes that I put in place. Oftentimes as helpers, we're in the action stage. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And a person that we're trying to help might be in a pre-contemplation or a contemplation stage. We're only setting ourselves up for burnout and frustration if we do that. Instead, meet them where they're at in the stage of change they're in. If I meet a person in pre-contemplation, it means success for me isn't getting them to action by the end of that day. It's helping them move from pre-contemplation to contemplation, from not even thinking about change to considering what change might look like for them. So we've talked about oh, being open, being relational, right? Being holistic, and now offering support that's sustainable. Finally, I want to look at this idea of providing support that is resourceful. It's my last area. We need to know our resources. Why? Because a lot of pastors tell me this statement. I don't make referrals to human service providers because I don't know who I can trust. But here's the problem. If you never make referrals because you don't know who you can trust, instead of getting to know who you can trust, you're going to find yourself in situations like many other clergy I know who say things like, wow, I'm in a situation that feels way over my pay grade. I don't know how to offer help to this person who's going through a severe mental health crisis in my faith community. What should I do? You need to know people that you can call during those times. No local resources. So if you were in my area, I would tell you to put this number in your phone. Um, the mobile crisis number. And there's probably a mobile crisis team in your own county, wherever you are. I'm in the Philadelphia area, but wherever you are, there should be a mobile crisis team where no matter what the situation is you're facing, um, unless you're in immediate danger and you call 911, there's a crisis team you can call so that they can support you in both trying to stabilize the crisis, resolve the crisis, and plan for future crises. These are all the different resources that I might consider, again, if you were living in my area. In addition to mobile crisis, things like mobile psychiatric rehabilitation, groups like NAMI that have support groups, peer support, who, who are the inpatient hospitalization providers? What are the residential programs? What are those faith-based counseling or psychiatric supports that are in my area? All these resources are good to know so that you're not helping someone all by yourself and so that when a situation feels a little too much, you have someone else you can reach out to. Now, how do you know if you should or shouldn't refer? There's a few different questions you might wanna consider asking. Uh, you might ask, who's a conversation partner I can call to think through this? Who's someone who knows more than I do about this? But they're not necessarily, it doesn't mean I'm actually referring the person yet. Is there trauma or abuse present? If there is, that tells me this really should need something more than what I can offer. Is the person's behavior keeping them from normal daily living activities? Can they not even get out of bed you know, in the morning? Uh, can they not get to work like usual to care for their needs? Uh, that's another reason I would want to refer. Um, is the person open to exploring medication? If they are, that's going to need a psychiatrist or a doctor to be involved of some sort. All those are ways of thinking through the question, should I? refer. And if you're going to discuss resources, um, here are some resources to consider discussing. Um, what resources have you found most helpful in your own life? Have, has there been someone who's referred you to a resource or have you referred others to a resource in your area? And what resources would you like know, to know more about? What are those resources that you can take time today learning more about for the sake of yourself and people that you're supporting in your congregation and community? So I just want to thank you for taking the time to think together about this issue um, of supporting people in your congregation with uh, their community with mental health struggles. Um, please contact me. My email will be provided if I can be of any further help to you. And uh, thank you for taking the time to take this sort of work seriously.